In this video, I want to talk about how we do FGLS in practice. And the F here stands for feasible again, um, because of the fact that in this particular circumstance, we don't actually know the explicit form of the serial correlation. So the sort of model which we specified in the last video, whereby we had yt is equal to alpha plus beta xt plus ut as a sort of primary model, and then we had an AR1 process for our errors as sort of written here. The idea in practice is that we don't know this particular parameter rho, so we have to estimate that. So we have to have an, a strategy for identifying rho. And so how do we go about doing this? Well, it's much in similar vein to that which we used in the case of heteroscedasticity. In fact, it's actually a bit simpler. So the idea is that the first regression we run is just our primary model. So that's yt is equal to alpha plus beta xt plus ut. And the idea here is that we use our OLS estimates of alpha and beta hat and then that yields us our residuals, which we call um, ut hat. So that's the first step. The second step, if you haven't guessed it, is then to use these residuals to then actually sort of mimic the population error process, which we specified. So we regress ut hat on ut hat minus one, or ut minus one hat rather. And the coefficient which we get from that particular regression is our estimate of rho or rho hat, as I've sort of written it here. And also from this regression, we sort of get our sort of estimate of the population errors ET, which we call ET hat. And the idea here is that we then use this particular estimated parameter rho hat in order to perform the same sort of transformation which we talked about in the last video. So the idea here is that we take yt and then we take rho hat times yt minus one from, from that, which yields, we're gonna get here on the right hand side, alpha times one minus rho hat plus beta times um, xt minus rho hat times xt minus one. And then the idea of the residuals is essentially we get ET hat here on the right hand side. So we've done away with the serial correlation. So in principle, this ET hat here should be serially uncorrelated. One thing I want to sort of mention quickly is that there are essentially two different methods which get talked about in the literature for estimating rho. The first is what we call the Cochrane all, all cut procedure. And in the Cochrane all cut procedure, we essentially just do what we've indicated here in the sort of second step. And because of that, we actually omit the first observation because there is no sort of observation before the first observation. So I can't actually estimate this relationship for the case when t equals zero. So by omitting that first observation, I'm missing out on a bit of information. The, what we call the praise Winston procedure looks to sort of remedy that situation by actually taking into account on using this first observation in a useful way. But in principle, sort of asymptotically, these things are basically the same. Okay, so what properties does FGLS have in sort of practice? So the first thing to say is that FGLS is no longer blue. In fact, it's biased. Uh, and that's because of the fact that we're using our estimated parameter rho hat rather than rho itself. And the sort of penalty we pay for that is that in sort of final samples, FGLS is biased. But a good thing is that if we assume that we have strict exogeneity of errors, which means that the expectation of our sort of error term, given xt and in this case where AR1 errors, xt minus one and xt plus one, we know that that has to be equal to zero. Um, well, if we assume that that's equal to zero, rather, it turns out that FGLS is consistent. And this sort of assumption which we've written up here at the top is slightly different to what we assume in our sort of cross-sectional um, Gauss-Markov assumptions. In the cross-sectional case, we sort of just had that the expectation of UT given XT was equal to zero. Whereas now we have got this sort of xt and xt minus one and xt plus one. So this is what we call the strict exogeneity um, assumption. So that's a little bit more restrictive and it actually turns out to be um, the sort of equivalent 
Gauss-Markov assumption, but in the case of time series. So we're going to go on to discuss that in due course. So we've got that under this assumption, we know that FGLS is biased, but as n approaches infinity, FGLS is asymptotically unbiased, so it's consistent. And finally, we know that FGLS, or the variance of FGLS, is less than the variance of ordinary least squares as the sample size tends to infinity. So it's asymptotically more efficient than ordinary least squares.